Hey folks, thanks for coming along. Um, braving what in hindsight was probably one of the more pretentious speaker bios and, uh, and, and uh, introductions to this speech of any on the list. Um, my name's Simon Whittier, I'm a principal engineer with Groupon. I'm based out of Chicago. Um, as a Brit living in the USA, I feel a bit like a, a piece of roast beef in a very popular sandwich right now. Um, it's interesting to see which way it will go. So I'd like to talk to you about a tool called Sparklint. Um, we built this within Groupon. This is a classic uh, side project that was built from necessity. Um, so why did we build it? Spark was an interesting uh, deployment for us at Groupon. We, we had a massive need for a distributed cluster. We had a few, uh, a few different types of technology out there doing it. Um, we chose to make a bet on Spark. Um, and the cluster itself was provisioned up front to, to provide enough capacity for, for, for the platforms that were designed to run on it, systems that were designed to run on it. But like with any successful Spark cluster, I, I imagine, um, there was a problem with popularity. So as the, as the platform rolled out and as tools were built on it and as the tools proved successful uh, and as Spark lived up to some of its promise, um, there was an inevitable uh, rush to either migrate existing systems on the legacy hardware over to it, or to build new things, new fancy things. People go to conferences, pick up some great ideas, want to come home and uh, play with it. So um, that leads to resource contention. Um, and it's a capacity and capability mismatch. Right? It's a shared cluster. You've got teams on there who have built their apps months ago, who've been running their apps, who've spent the time to tune their apps. Um, you have other folks that are coming on with best intentions, but maybe lower skill levels. Uh, and generally, what you end up with is it's designed to do this, but you end up with a lot of different types of usage on the same core platform. Now, when you're trying to allocate resources, uh, that can actually be really, really tricky to manage. A massive MapReduce job on your, on your Hadoop cluster that happens to be hosting Spark um, is very difficult to run alongside lots of different Spark streaming jobs, which may be claim resources up front and maintain them for the whole time. So we, let, we found that, you know, the platform itself were, were, was, was, was great, but its usage was potentially uh, inefficient. We found tuning to be a little bit tricky at first. Um, there's a lot of parameters, there's a lot of different things, a lot of moving parts, and not every run is the same. Um, and we also found the current UI, as rich and deep as it is, I mean, you can click around in that thing for the whole of your life and not find the bottom of it. But it's, um, it's incredibly rich, but it's also very, very operational in focus. We didn't find anywhere in the UI where the current standard Spark UI where we, where we could really get at the kind of long-running metrics that we needed to try and figure out what was going on in these jobs. And so, ultimately, we just wanted to understand application efficiency. Uh, and so, now uh, we build a tool. This thing's crazy. Okay. So, what does Sparklint provide? There's two modes of running Sparklint. Um, under the hood, Spark emits an event stream. The UI itself is essentially a consumer of that event stream. Uh, it's all via the, available via the developer API. It's absolutely fascinating to get in there and dig about and see how it's been built. Um, and so as we start to dig into that UI, we realized we could do something similar. Um, so there are two broad modes that consume the event stream. Now, you can take Spark Lint and run it, as a streaming, uh, run it on top of a streaming application or any batch application as a, uh, a listener. Um, what that means is that the listener ends up, ends up embedded in the Spark context and it receives the event stream in the same way as the main UI. Now, that means that in real time you can get a view of what's running that isn't necessarily the UI and, and, and we decided to build a server that sat inside the listener um, that allowed us to view those long-running jobs. And so, initially we just got this interesting uh, kind of analytical view of long-running jobs from an efficiency standpoint. Um, and so we decided to, to point it at some existing event sources that we had in our history server. Um, we grabbed a load of those, and what we realized was once you have this packaged event source, a uh, set of events, you can actually rewind, forward wind. You can do whatever you want with this. So if what you want to do is take a Spark, in Spark job, uh, and after the event, try and analyze it for its efficiency, this would be an interesting way of doing it. So the broad architecture, um, in terms of a listener, I don't know how clear this is, it's actually super easy. The whole thing is really quite simple in there. Um, 
to implement a uh, to implement the Spark listener, it's essentially a straight object model, and you define the on event method, which you then uh, you then fork out. And there are strongly typed events available, uh, all from the event source. And um, what's happening behind the scene? You've seen a diagram similar to this a hundred times already. Job stages and tasks are shipped out to workers, uh, and the event stream comes back to the uh, to the driver node, and and that's where you get all your main source of information from. Um, this is a little bit inside what's going on in what we've called the Spark Firehose listener. Um, you can just see here, it's a representation, the events come into an event buffer, which is keeping those events separate, separated from the actual UI, which is rendering them, enabling the two things to run at different speeds, which is really, really useful with Spark, because what tends to happen, particularly with parallel jobs and, and highly distributed jobs, is you get a real burst of tasks coming in. The task start events come through in a massive burst. The task, task ends come in trickling. Um, but in order to handle that burst, you need, you need some kind of buffering. Otherwise, it, it kind of slows down the, uh, the listener. Um, so the event buffer itself contains all the events. It's handed over to a Sparklint server. Sparklint server is a straight HTTP 4S server hosted inside the Spark listener, the Spark Firehose listener component here. We take up one thread. So it runs in its own thread. Um, the, the reading thread is separated, um, and it sits in the, in the driver node like that. Uh, it serves up static um, static uh, assets, and in fact, we, we, we lent on the way the Spark UI does its rendering, and, and Scala has a very nice inbuilt um, HTML, XHTML DSL, which we've used as well. Ooh, Sparklint server. So, so this is the thing I'm going to demo today. The listener is actually a, a little bit more difficult to demo in, a, in an isolated position like this. Um, what the Sparklint server does is it, it, it essentially takes a, a set of event sources in a directory. You can start it in two modes, three when we get the history server automatic API integration worked out. But uh, in this case, what we're going to do is start, start uh, Sparklint server and, and point at a directory. That directory has been pre-filled with a bunch of event sources that we've gone and harvested from our, from our history server ahead of time. In the background, it's polling that directory. So short term, what we did until we got the history server API working out is we've just done some timed SCP copies from the history server from the HDFS. Um, underpinnings that will dump in the directory, and then Sparkling Server will actually pick those up and pre analyze for them. And, and you'll see in the UI how they get listed and how you can actually dig deeper into each of these things. Um, so, a demo. Uh, it's going to be kind of a hybrid demo. Uh, I'm going to show you, so there's nothing up my sleeves and all that stuff, um, but I'm actually going to switch back to, uh, to, to the presentation. I found it easier to talk to, to, to slides that are image captures of the actual software itself. So. This is, a, this is a simulation. I've got one example job in here at the end, which is a real job from inside Groupon that shows one that's been optimized. Um, and I've got a, essentially a simulated workload analyzing site access logs. So this is basically URLs that are being hit in any given um, event stream through, uh, through any given website. If, if your routing layer is, is recording this, you're going to have the URL, you're going to have the HTTP verb, you're likely to have the response status, and you're going to have the time plus the source IP. This is pretty common. Um, the workload is just reading the file as JSON, converts it to a record, and then it does three counts. Count by IP, count by status, count by verb. That's it. This is, um, this is not unusual for something that might happen in, in a streaming job, which is taking batch windows of, of, of the stream on Kafka or something straight out of your, your routing layer, and it's just going to chunk it up and do this repeatedly and update some counts somewhere, probably by buckets. Uh, it's really reduced by key in the core, um, and so we're going to have a go showing this. So I'm going to switch out to this. Start it running, I think. Oh, man. OK. It's going to go do its thing. It's now reading all of the event sources in. So I can switch out to, oh, this is a horrible resolution. What am I going to get here? Oh. Hmm. Okay, we'll do it this old fashioned way. Is that still remotely visible? Yeah, we're okay. Okay, so I'm going to demo. Um, this looks much better in a decent resolution, by the way. But I'm going to demo. This is an existing job, just, just to show you what's, what's going on in here. So let me f at least give me this shot. Right, okay. So what you've got down the left here uh, is a series of event sources as have been found in that directory. 
Um, these are actually the demo that I'm going to switch back to the, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the slide deck for. But I'm going to show you how it works with this Juno hourly, right? This is a real job from, from, from inside Groupon. Um, what this is doing is it, it's running aggregates. Um, there are two broad phases to this job. You can see in the early phase, we've got uh, a graph here showing core, time, core, core usage time series over the entire execution of the job. It's a, it's, an, it's a job that has 1,436 events, and this, this UI is just showing us that it's pre-processed them all. It knows the start and end time. It took 43 minutes. It gives you the, the time dates. And here are some rough measures of efficiency, right? These two here. This one here is showing you how many executors you used, and you've got a core count down here on the left-hand side, so you can do some math over how, how many cores each executor is running. Core utilization in this job is at 82%. Now, that's, that's pretty efficient. Most of the time when you just throw jobs at, at production, you're gonna, you, well, it depends how you've written it, but if you know what you're doing, you're going to get around 40 to 60% out front. Um, and we've got very little idle time. There is a little bit. Idle time is generally an indication that you've ended up back on the driver node. So your calculation may have gone out to the workers, brought something back to the driver node, done some more calculations there, and then fed it back out to the workers again, generally. And you should try and avoid that. Often that's a case of uh, simply collecting an array and doing a map on an array when you could probably map on an RDD and keep it on the workers. So in this case, it's pretty good. We've got two broad areas of execution here, and, and the, the, the the model is bimodal. The, the application is essentially bimodal, if that's the right term. And you can see what this graph does. Um, what we're doing here is we're taking a timeline of, of the execution of the application, and at any given time, based on the event stream, we're calculating how many individual nodes are in use, how many cores are in use, and the locality of that data. So you can see here we've got um, the red is, is, is the any, rack local is orange, node local is yellow, process local is green. And if you've done a lot of tuning, you know that what you really want, and sometimes you can't avoid it, but what you really want is as much proce process local processing as possible. That means your, uh, your partitioning is correct and uh, you're reducing your shuffles to a minimum. Now, this thing's grabbing data from Kafka. Um, so it comes in from a whole bunch of brokers. Um, in fact, this one's doing it. This is a post process. So this is doing it from HDFS. So what happens here is early on, they, they've essentially taken uh, the full 200 core count here. Um, uh, and it, it's, it's efficient, right? Because what you can see is each of, these, um, each, each, of these, each of these graphs is basically maxed out with a flat top. Now, that means we're CPU bound. And really, the game inside Spark, in, in our opinion, was, was to, to, to make yourself CPU bound. Because if you're CPU bound, then you get to tweak levers, right? You, you know how much, it, potentially you know how much it costs to run your CPUs in your, in, your, in your cluster. Therefore, you can understand how much it costs to run this model. But equally, your SLA, i.e. the time taken to execute the model, is another thing which might cost you money. You know, if you don't get paid, if you don't hit your SLA, you're much more likely to trade core usage and, and, and a slight wastage on the cluster to ensure that you get in below your SLA time. So we're CPU bound here, which is great. We can see the early data gathering phase, which you can't do anything about. It, it will naturally spread out. You want to see that. You can see this data gathering. And then I'd imagine in here is where the idle comes, where it essentially ends up farming back out results, uh, results to, a, to a second part of the algorithm. Now, this second part of the algorithm only uses 40 cores. Now, I know that that was optimum, and I know that was chosen in order to optimize file size in the other side of the I.O. Um, and so, really, this number has been optimized by a secondary process. What we can say is, because it's, there's 40 cores, they're absolutely maxed out. Um, and this, there is little gray. Gray is real wastage. If you see gray on the graph, then you're wasting resources. And in this case, dynamic allocation is turned on, which is the right move, because as you can see, as the use of the cores tails off, so does the, uh, the, 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 the claiming of the cores. And then for the second part of this, this model, where it doesn't need all of those cores, it's simply running the 40 that it, that it, that it uh, requires. You can see, again, the bimodal nature is represented in the core, core usage distribution here. This is, this is the second part where, where it's doing the, the number crunching, and this is the first part where it's doing the data gathering. And what I can do here, if I actually had it all on one screen, is I've got a little, <laughs> oh my word, I've got a little control panel down here which simply doesn't render. Um, and I can run this back to the start. Now, if I can get this, what we have is a selection of numbers, yay. And here we can navigate through by events, tasks, stages, and jobs. Now, if you know how your, how your application is built, then you know, in this case, we've got two main stages. We've got the data gathering stage, and we've got the, the, the processing stage. And so what I should be able to do here is, is just navigate forward one stage. Okay? Now, in that one stage are many, many hundreds of events. But I'm just going to push it through. 
The first stage is the data gathering phase, so you can look at that individually, and now you've got just the core distribution, core usage, and you're just, just seeing what's happening in that stage. And I can move on to the next one, which will bring in that second phase. Uh, and now I'm 94% oh, of the way through this. So, um, so this is basically just a way of looking at that job over time in, in an interesting way to show you what's going on under the hood in a, in a very, very obvious graphical way. There's a whole ton of information that we're not even surfacing in this. We're really only scratching the surface of what we can do. So in order to get away from this horrible resolution, I'm going to go back to the slides for sure to do this second part of the demo. OK, so I'm going to walk you through um, that sample job that I spoke about, which is essentially uh, three reduced by key steps uh, on top of some data gathering. Now, I'm going to do a hypothetical tuning process here. So, so we take this job, and, and we stick it on our server, and we run it. And, and we know roughly from previous runs of other jobs that we're just going to start with 16 cores across four executors. And that's, that's going to be our, our start point. Now, when you analyze this, what you can see from, from uh, ooh, I've lost it. there it is. What you can see here is the job took 10 minutes, 7 seconds to finish. That's our baseline. That's our not even trying baseline. We've got zero idle time. Now, zero idle time is saying, OK, you're, you're doing kind of the right thing. You're allowing the workers to do their job. You're not trying to shuffle them about too much. You're not trying to bring the driver node in for too much. Um, but overall utilization is below 50%. It's pretty low. And you can see from the graph, uh, there's a lot of idle gray in there. And you've got all of these spikes. Um, the spikes are fine. Um, but we've got a lot of gray in there, and we, we wonder what, which way we're going to go, right? And this is now, at the moment anyway, a, a kind of a manual back and forth process, right? You're trying to find an efficient maximum, and that maximum is, you know, you're optimizing for whatever's in your mind, okay? So, so in this case, we're going to say, okay, why don't we try to optimize core usage and execution time? This is basically a, a very standard way of optimizing it. What can we do here? Well. First of all, let's figure out whether we're, we're, we're I.O. bound, uh, or, or sorry, whether we're CPU bound. It doesn't look it from the graph, but it will be interesting to rerun this job with less cores and see the effect on the execution time and the core usage. And so we, we, we trim it down. We're going to run it with eight cores, um, which hasn't opened, which decided it wasn't going to update on there. No? Anybody? OK, finally. So sample six, oh, no. Oh, this has gone mad. Have we got eight cores? Eight cores, yay. So sample eight cores. Um, it seems crazy, but let's just tune it down and see what happens, right? We're gathering information. We're doing analysis. We, we, we're not going to be right first time, so we might as well be wrong a lot and, 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 and at least try and do it smart. So here we go. We've, nailed it, uh, we, we've tuned it down a bit. We're getting 67% uh, core usage. Well, that's great. But we're also seeing a 15-minute execution time. Now, we halved the resources, and we only saw a 50% increase in time. Plus, we saw core utilization increase, but it's not maxed out. Now, it seems reasonable that we can't really CPU bound this by simply reducing cores. But there's clearly some flexibility there, because the 100% the reduction has, uh, has only led to a 50% increase. So let's go the other way. Let's see what happens if we try 32 cores. And it does update. OK, so the job took 9 minutes, 24 seconds to complete. Now, previously, with 16 cores, we were looking at a 10-minute 10 10 execution time. So realistically, doubling the, doubling the capacity has done almost nothing on execution time. And core utilization has gone through the floor. And you can see there's a ton of idle time. There's a big gray band, which you know there isn't anything approaching the 32 cores. This is an absolute classic case of resource over, over allocation. This is the kind of thing you find a lot of when people are running their own jobs with default settings without really thinking about it. And so we know that, that oh, this, OK. OK, so let's try dynamic allocation, right? This is a classic thing you can turn on. It doesn't help in every circumstance. It has some overhead, but we're going to try it anyway because we're experimenting. We're trying to find how this job works best. So we see now, we turn on dynamic allocation. We keep the defaults. So the job took 11 minutes to finish. That's nowhere different to, to where we were with the first 16 cores. It's decided to give us 24 executors with one core apiece. Now, core utilization is still low. And what we see here is that dynamic allocation isn't doing anything. Right? You see here that only really when you're ramping up, it's taking its time to give you the resources. But none of this gray area in the middle here uh, is showing any, any, any use from, the dynamic, from dynamic allocation. Now, 
One of the reasons why that might be is, is there is a default setting um, on the um, uh, executor idle timeout, which, uh, where are we now? Oh dear. On the executor idle timeout, um, which is one minute. And what we see here is we've got lots and lots of short running jobs. And so these jobs aren't sitting idle long enough for the dynamic allocation algorithm to return those resources to the pool. So dynamic allocation is doing nothing, but we know an angle. Let's tweak that angle. So let's turn down executor idle timeout to 10 seconds. So now you see that dynamic allocation is doing its job. You can see the gray lines tracking the tasks. Okay? But we ended up with a 33-minute execution time. So it's pretty efficient, 62% in core utilization, but it's taken 940 executors to do that over the entire process of the job, and it took 33 minutes. And that's dramatically increased, and that's really due to the algorithm trying to return resources to the pool. And negotiation at each step of this dynamic allocation process, particularly getting the resources, takes time. So we're seeing the impact here. I'm now pretty convinced that dynamic allocation isn't the answer to this problem. And so where do we go from here? We, we still want to try and get CPU bound. Now, the thing that we haven't tried, this is still a FIFO job, right? It's, it's scheduling execution internally is to take all three of those jobs and simply execute them first in, first out. And so we can go in there and make a simple tweak to add parallelism, use first scheduling, and then execute all three in parallel. And we'll see what that does to the, to the under use, underlying usage patterns. Okay. So now we're getting somewhere. We're back at 16 cores, which is where we started. We've turned off dynamic allocation, and we've increased parallelism inside the individual job. And now you can see it's starting to get somewhere. So we're down to seven minutes and seven and a half minutes from 10 minutes in execution time. We're up at 80% core utilization. And you can see some flat tops on this graph showing we're, be we're beginning to be uh, CPU bound by this. So I'm now pretty happy that we're close to the, to the end state for this job. It's looking pretty good. We should test our, our assumption. Let's try it by throwing more resources at it, see whether we can get that time down. So let's stick it up to 32 cores, and yeah, we, we, we've got it down to five minutes, and that's great. But you look at the core utilization, okay? Um, we're no longer CPU bound as, as much for as much of this, of this application, and we're down at 60.74%. But now you have a choice, okay? Because you can now execute in five minutes with 60% efficiency, or you can execute in seven minutes with 80% efficiency. And these are great trade-offs to have on a platform, particularly if you're administering the platform, and if there's a lot of people on there. Uh, you get to you know, do some interesting background analysis on, on, on who you can help to, uh, to improve and, and, and point them at the tool. Um, and this is a Juno Hourly again, um, which I've already gone into enough detail. I don't know. Future features. So I think, I think it's pretty, pretty interesting what we've done here in, in terms of this view, right? It's, it's super easy to distinguish CPU bound um, uh, applications here, um, which is exactly what we're trying to do. I wish this commentary wouldn't would stop flashing at me. Um, so it's very easy to spot when it's doing it. And, and, and equally, it's very easy to see if you're throwing twice the resources at it, what the end result is. Uh, and you can do it like side by side, okay? You can run three or four jobs with different parameters and then bring them up in this UI and begin to look at them side by side. You don't have to switch in and out and delve deep into the, the, the Spark UI itself and try and understand what's going on here. Um, it gives you an opportunity to, to trade off dollars for, from faster, uh, faster execution for dollars spent in providing more cores. Um, and it very, very easily lets you determine whether you can, you can in introduce some scheduling into, into there to introduce parallelism. Um, but there are future features. It's really quite early on in this. You saw it's, it's, not, it's not super rich. And as I said, we're really only scratching the surface of what's down on, in that event stream. Um, we're looking to very quickly introduce uh, improved job and stage detail in the UI. It's nice to think that up ahead, you know exactly how your jobs are, are structured. But when your job count gets high, it would be nice to have a count of stages, a count of tasks, a count of jobs, and some information about each, plus an ability to surface the parameters that you've started each individual job with. All the data's there. We're just trying to get it out. The other thing I mentioned was the history server. The history server, you should be able to take Sparklint. We had this few issues with our API. You should be able to take Sparklint, point it at the history server, and allow it to download as the history server um, makes its way through various jobs. There's, there's a way to poll to say, you know, what are your current applications? Each of those applications has a zip file somewhere in, 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 in wherever your persistence layer is. Go grab it 
drag it to the local machine, unpack it, analyze it, and then report on it. And equally, you should be able to do some pretty simple filtering there because you get the application name within the first three me messages. So you can do regex filters and say, nope, not interested in that. Going to throw it away. Inline recommendations, it would be super nice to have that UI do my talking for me. Um, and then I wouldn't have to worry about all this commentary flashing in and out constantly. Um, Auto-tuning, this is really exciting, right? If you can get, if we can figure out a way of auto-launching these jobs, then you should just be able to throw a job at this and allow it to auto-tune, right? Because none of the stuff that we're doing there is difficult and really a human-based decision. We're looking at numbers, execution time, we're looking at core utilization, we're looking at counts of cores, we're looking at dynamic allocation. And all of this should be controllable. So it should be theoretically possible to say, okay, here's my Sparkmint server, here's my, here's my job execution, I'm just going to set it to run and I'd like you to auto-tune. And Sparkmint should be able to run five, six executions of that job and, and make a determination and a recommendation of the type of parameters you should use to execute it efficiently. And then the next stage on from that is to hook into streaming stage parameter delegation. This is, this is super exciting, and, and uh, I'll get onto the lead dev in, in a minute, but he's really, really pushing on this one. Um, in a long-running streaming job, it would be really nice if you could understand the dynamic nature of the platform underneath you and the dynamic nature of the load that you're processing and allow the parameters to be, to be tuned stage by stage. Because if you think about what's happening, every time you're executing a batch, there's, there's a stage or stages being repeated. So every single previous batch that you execute feeds data into a system that can allow you to tune latter batches. But you don't really want to have to kill the job, apply a set of parameters, and start it again. And so it should be possible to, to shell out to a server that would give you the, the recommended parameters for your job at that given time. And so on. Onto the credit. So, uh, lead developer on this is a guy called Rob Jouet. Um He is, wow, he's getting increasingly, <laughs> sorry, Robert. <laughs> this is my way of, 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 of convincing you not to hire him. I'm going to obscure him that way. So, so Robert Jouet is, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's a great dev. He and I had a conversation about being frustrated with, with, with platform uh, stability issues, and, uh, and we wanted to look at our own jobs. and. Um, you know, we, we were super impressed with the UI, but we, we just couldn't find what we needed in there. And so he and I sat down, had a bit of a chat over a lunch, and, and he's the kind of guy that came back two weeks later with the prototype. So um, many thanks to him, and, and really I've, I've, I've chipped in with ideas and a lot of code in there as well, but, but this is the guy that's going to be leading the project in, uh, in the future. And if I can get this slide to show... Wow, that was not what I wanted. Okay, we'll try something else. Can I get right to the end? Hey, this is it. Contribute. It's open source. It's still private as of today. Uh, it will be public by the end of the day. Um, we've gone through all the processes inside Groupon to get this open sourced, so it's ready to go. Uh, only Robert and I are contributors right now, but we're really looking for, for anybody who wants to come and, come and join us to help contribute to the tool. As I say, there's so much stuff in there that we haven't even touched. It's a classic skunk work project. We've done it on the side, um, and we'd really, really like to see people pick this up and run with it. Um, so come talk to me if you want in. Uh, as I say, it's still private, but it will be open. Uh, we're working on getting a public sonar type up um, and the CI integration finished before we're really kind of comfortable opening it up and saying to the world, come in. But special guests like yourselves are absolutely welcome. So thank you. That's Spark Lint.